Welcome to Literary Hangover. I'm Matt Leck with me, Alex Guns. Hello. And uh, today is part two of James Fenimore Cooper's 1823 novel, The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna. Uh, this is the first of the Leatherstocking tales, and uh, I think, well, I haven't read all of them. I've read this in Leather St- and uh, Last of the Mohicans. Finding a lot of depth to this one, I didn't find evident in either uh, Last of the Mohicans or The Spy, um, but maybe I didn't read Last of the Mohicans deep enough. But there's a lot of, lot to get into in this novel, um, so that's why we're doing a part two. Yeah, so this one is the the first of the Leatherstocking Tales, which basically means it's the first with Natty Bumpo. Uh, but I think Bumpo, sorry, I always yeah. put a K in Bumpco. there. Bumpo. Uh, I think it's because it sounds like Bunko, which is a classic Midwest card game. <laughs> but I think it is in chronology the one that it's like the last or second to last, right? Uh, the last is the Prairie, but, right? Uh, and you can tell because it's all uh, alphabetical. Um, oh, so it goes. Um, let's see if I can do this off the top of my head. There's a Deer Slayer, which is actually the last written, right? Uh, then there's Last of the Mohicans. Then there's the Pathfinder. Then the of the the pioneers and then the prairie right actually the reason i came around to um wanting to spend more time on fenimore cooper it it owes in no small part to a little guy named richard slotkin who i've cited before but he's sort of a myth historian of the of america um this book we'll talk about today is regeneration through violence the mythology of the american frontier 1600 to 1860 And uh, there's a nice long section on the Leatherstocking Tales, and uh, here's a little bit of that intro. The Leatherstocking Cycle begins with The Pioneers, published in 1823, and concludes with The Deerslayer, 1841. The first novel introduces the frontier hero, Natty Bumpo, in the social context of a frontier settlement in New York State an idealized portrait of Cooper's own home in Cooperstown, New York. Natty is an old man on the verge of decrepitude, the representative of an admirable but vanishing breed of man, the Indian-like hunters of the first frontier. Natural and social necessity demands that he give way before the laws and the ways of settlement folk. In the last novel, Natty is a youth on the verge of manhood, embarking on his first warpath. Discarding the Christian name given him through baptism, he is seeking to make new names, new identities, for himself through his deeds as a hunter and warrior, for like the Indian he identifies with and takes his name from the things he hunts and slays. The Deerslayer's quest is enacted in conditions of almost perfect solitude, far from the settlements themselves, in the physical and psychological isolation of the dreamlike forest. Leather stocking, in the course of the cycle, passes from old age through death, in the prairie, 1827, into a new youth. Thus the legend of leather stocking, as it unfolded for the American reader of 1820-45, was a myth of renewal and rebirth of the hero. Moreover, the movement backward in historical time to leather stocking's youth was accompanied by a movement toward a more mythopoeic conception of the wilderness, a greater use of Indian mythology, and a concentration of focus on the psychology of a single personality, such as had characterized the Puritan personal narrative literature and made it capable of generating myth. The seeds of this ultimate development can be found in the pioneers. The structure of Cooper's first serious novel, The Spy, had been very much in the Scott tradition, an historically important conflict, the revolution, between opposing components of a single race, mirrored in a family conflict. In the pioneers Cooper turned from an obviously important conflict to a more subtle one, that between the Indian world and the white. He shifted his interest from the artificially recreated world of the revolution to the world he had known in his youth. Instead of applying the techniques of Scott to American events, he was re-examining his own past and heritage, his own perceptions of and role in the creation of the new American world. This turn toward self-examination and the examination of the real frontier world of Cooperstown was accompanied by a deep interest in the mythology and character of the Indians and of the white men who lived with and came to resemble them. 
The narratives relating to Boone's life certainly the Filson text in Wilder's and Trumbull's editions and probably Flint's studies in the 1830s formed part of his reading and supplied incidents and images to several novels in the cycle. Certainly he was aware of the literature of Indian captivities that was a staple of colonial and later New England popular literature. The capture of white women by Indians and associated villains and their rescue by Leatherstocking and his associates is the recurrent theme of the action in all the novels save the pioneers. Perhaps his most important reading was in Hecawelder's study of Indian culture, history, and mythology. From Hecawelder he took what he believed to be myths expressive of the Indians' own conception of their history and an idea of the importance of their sense of spiritual intimacy with the land and intimacy that gave them strength while it lasted but made them vulnerable to moral degeneration when the preemption of the land by the whites had displaced them. Although he had immersed himself in American source materials while writing The Pioneers, Cooper was still very much under the spell of Scott and of the myth of progress through conflict and Christian reconciliation which informed the historical romance. Thus the pioneers first exhibits the characteristic formal division of the Cooper novel into a plot and the thematic leatherstocking saga. The plot, involving romantic themes of star and class-crossed love and family division, justifies the writing of the novel in terms of the literary conventions established in Europe and imported to the East. Its sources are essentially European, as are the attitudes it embodies. The romantic heroes and heroines, and their foils or accomplices, are almost always stereotypes, two-dimensional stock figures from Scott or the novel of manners. The thematic saga, which has its origin in the quasi-fictional narrative literature of the colonies and in the Indian legends collected by Hecawelder, relates to the character development of the hunter-hero Leatherstocking and his Indian associates. The two parts of the novel interact at various points but are in many essentials independent. As the cycle approaches its culmination in the Deerslayer, Leatherstocking's personal narrative comes to dominate plot, and Leatherstocking himself becomes the single focus of the novel. This formal ambivalence in the novel is not simply a result of Cooper's hasty writing and defective craftsmanship. The two formal elements grow out of different mythological antecedents, Indian and European, and these myths prove to be the sources of the central conflict in the pioneers. The novel tells two stories the reconciliation of the Temples and the Effinghams, families divided in the Revolution, through the marriage of Oliver Effingham and Miss Temple, and the destruction of the world of the primitive frontier, symbolized in the death of Indian John and the exile of Natty Bumpo. Oliver is Bumpo's friend and protege and is rescued by him, with Miss Temple, from the climactic forest fire. But Bumpo's conflict with Judge Temple is unrelated to that which divides the Temples and the Effinghams. Bumpo wishes to live by the laws of the Indian and the hunter, killing meat for use only, unlike the settlers, but doing that whenever the spirit moves and in despite of game laws. The central conflict in the novel is, in effect, between two different modes of perception, that which regards Bumpo's conflict with Temple as the most significant struggle in the town, and that which regards the Effingham Temple misunderstanding as most crucial. In the context of the Indian mythology which Cooper employs to characterize Natty and Indian John, the former is of ultimate significance, in the context of the conventions of the historical romance, the second is of more pertinent interest. I thought that was a pretty concise summary of how uh, Cooper sort of evolved or graduated from the Walter Scott model in the spy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Harvey Birch is the most memorable character from the spy by far. Mm -hmm. And he's just a sort of proto Nettie Bumpo uh, character. Also, uh, we'll get into more of this later, but uh, like what that character means to Cooper uh, is interesting to me because he's above Cooper himself is the, the son of a you know massive the the central New York landlord at the yeah. time, so he's in station above these guys, but he's obsessed with them. And b one of the weird you know things that's consistent about them, not only that they're skilled sort of like woodsmen or um, scouts or whatever ha what have you. But they're also both racist. Like they're the, the the racist sentiments towards black characters, right? To their face, 
usually comes most notably from those the like Harvey Birch and Natty Bumpo characters. But I don't know. It's I I can't quite put my finger on what Cooper is doing by right. Is he imagining himself as like un, like a lesser class or something? I th- I think that is close. I feel like it's something close to he's imagining his synthesis like a better synthesis with the land around him than cooper is or maybe it's his antithesis it's something about because he's such a prominent character bumpo and he's thriving until this point this is the this is his like cresting moment when he has to he fails after this i think right but there's something about he's ostensibly a european male who at some point who's successfully interwoven himself in what america is at that moment like that includes like native american culture Mm -hmm. in a way that i think cooper does not he's quite interested about it and writes quite a lot about it and i think that bumpo is the cipher of which to like his his doorway into that world but he is right this someone who lives in the namesake town (laughs) that uh like yeah, yeah. Like Fenimore Cooper, uh, he is decidedly has not synthesized with uh, the American culture at that time. Right. And there is no like William Temple or, or like the younger son. Yeah. Right. It is probably the case that if Cooper identifies with anybody in this, it's Oliver. Well, that yeah. And that's that's to me one of the more interesting storylines in this is that I think Oliver is a surrogate um, inheritor to both Natty Bumpo and to the judge. Yes. And it's the judge that wins out via marriage. Right. Because he was about to lose his land, and then he also... But then somehow gets it back, essentially. Well, and the other thing... I mean, we'll just get to it right away. Spoiler alert. But he's also an inheritor of uh, uh, John Mohegan, or Indian John, or Chingachcook. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, I mean, Mohe- one, John uh, tells him to uh, become Temple's assistant. Yeah. Uh, he's not going to until John says that. And then also, you know, John dies. Uh, you know, there's the uh, spoiler. Um, and, uh, right as, uh, Oliver takes the throne essentially through the marriage to, um, uh, Marmaduke's daughter, yeah. Elizabeth, which is like a great way of just like answering the deer problem, uh, from the beginning, which is for the judge. It's, it's mine. Yeah. You must, <laughs> I got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which is like a beautiful little crystallization of what's going on in America at that exact moment. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, uh, we'll, actually, let's play a little bit more before we get into some of the race issues here. All right, uh, gonna return to our, uh, you know, literary hangover regular Alan Taylor. Uh, this time, not, uh, we're not, not on his great book, uh, William Cooperstown, but this on a one specific to, um, the, <laughs> the, uh, settlement of central New York. Uh, it's called, the Great Change Begins Settling the Forest of Central New York. It was, pub- it was published in New York History uh, in 1995. And this is just, yeah, like I said, a little background on the settling of uh, this area. During the early Republican era, the 40 years after the end of the revolution, Americans experienced unprecedented and accelerating social and environmental changes. Between 1780 and 1820 American settlers occupied, cleared, and farmed more land, and founded more new communities, than in the preceding 180 years of colonization. Collaterally, Native Americans suffered the loss of more land and independence than ever before. The early American Republic was a land of increasing internal migration and of proliferating new communities created on the frontier margins. From 1780 to 1820, more colonization, more land was colonized uh, or taken than in the preceding 180 years. That's it reminds me of one of those like Hawthorne's ironies of history where it's like uh, a set of colonies asserting their individual liberty, then the process of which... Uh, speeds up the process of stealing other people's land <laughs> yeah gerald horn the counter-revolution of 1776 which is, which is more uh more about slavery than disposition of the native americans but really opening the floodgates when all of a sudden the king can't say like you know or or i mean maybe it's not just that but that that seemed to be a massive i think it, that was a big part of it yeah well all of a sudden this massive swath of territory is now formally organized 
instead of just being like 13 kind of related groupings that have to all report to a king who's across an ocean. Now, all of a sudden, you have a centralized federalist government that's like, go forth. Yeah. Slow to develop as a colony, New York quickly became the most dynamic state in the newly independent American Republic. During the 1780s and early 1790s treaties dispossessed the shrinking Iroquois tribes of most of their lands, thereby opening central and western New York to rapid resettlement by American citizens. By 1794 the Iroquois population in New York had shrunk to 3,500, less than half of their pre-war numbers. At the same time, thousands of Yankees flocked from crowded New England into upstate New York to displace the Iroquois and outnumber the longer resident, more ethnically mixed colonial population of New York. Owing primarily to that invasion, New York's population quadrupled from 340,120 in 1790 to 1,372,812 in 1820. In 1790 New York had been the nation's fifth state in population, lagging behind Virginia, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. By 1820 New York had become the most populous state in the nation as well as the national leader in commercial exports. Most of the newcomers settled in northern, central, and western New York, which dramatically shifted the distribution of the state's population. In 1785, three fourths of New Yorkers still lived in the Hudson Valley or along the Atlantic coast. In 1820, three fourths of the state's people lived in the newer counties to the north and west of Albany. In 1820, most New York towns were less than 40 years old and most of their residents had migrated from somewhere else. 38 of the state's 54 counties had been formed after 1780. The new nation's explosive demographic growth, territorial expansion, and environmental change exceeded in pace and extent the experience of any preceding American generation, and New York was the vanguard state of the developing nation. New York's post-revolutionary settlers wrought a dramatic environmental transformation as they replaced the Indians on the land. In the mid-19th century, Susan Fenimore Cooper observed the effect on Otsego County. The white man came to plant a home on this spot, and it was then that the great change began. The axe and the saw, the forge, and the wheel were busy from dawn to dusk. Cows and swine fed in thickets whence the wild beasts had fled, while the ox and the horse drew away in chains the fallen trunks of the forest. The tenants of the wilderness shrunk deeper within its bounds with every changing moon. The open valley, the half-shorn hills, the paths, the flocks, the buildings, the woods in their second growth, even the waters in the different images that they reflect on their bosom, the very race of men who come and go, all are different from what they were. The Iroquois economy had consisted of a subsistence agriculture supplemented by extensive hunting and gathering. The settlers used more land more intensively because they came in vastly greater numbers and because they sought a marketable surplus as well as family subsistence from their agriculture. Where the relatively small Iroquois population confined their agriculture to the best bottomlands along the larger rivers, the settlers came by the thousands and expanded up onto the hills and ridges, pushing their multiplying farms into almost every corner of the new state. In contrast to the Indians, who obtained most of their meat from fishing and hunting for wild, roaming animals, the settlers relied on domesticated livestock kept as private property. To secure meat, Indians needed extensive forests, and free-flowing rivers, in addition to the agricultural fields that provided their vegetables, fruits, legumes, and grains. In contrast, the settlers cleared away most of the forests and destroyed most of the wild mammals to render the landscape safe and productive for their livestock and for their more extensive fields of grain. Settlers dedicated their new farms to pastures and hay fields for their cattle and to fields of grains, especially wheat and Indian corn. In their drive to create tangible property, to produce grains for external markets, as well as for their own subsistence, and to maximize the number of privately owned animals, Settler families cleared and fenced much more land and built more and larger buildings than did the Indians. Yeah, it reminded me of this fact I happened to come across when I was doing some reading on colonial New York that the Dutch traders that first lived in New York State and then they became kind of like a an aristocratic class in 
New York Colony and then the New York State. And for some reason, I'm trying to find why, if there's any articulation for why, but it was very popular in Dutch households to have an icon representing the biblical story of Jacob stealing Esau's birthright, which they're both Isaac's sons, and Jacob ends up becoming the patriarch of Israel, and he tricked his father into getting his blessing to inherit his land. It's a very uh, morally ambiguous moment in Genesis. And what's so strange about that is you see this if you read enough history, which is people using images and figures that paint them in a light that we see them in, but you wouldn't think they would see themselves in Mm -hmm. because you'd think that they're admitting in some way, they're putting in the, the heart of their New York frontier home, the historical fact that they're taking someone else's birthright. And so in this process of like accumulation, it's, there's this odd historical artifact that I'm trying to understand why they would do that. Is is it this one with like the candle? Yes, yeah. Weird. Very and s- it was yeah, it's some Dutch obsession. Like they even named uh, a town called Jacob and Esau in their colony Guiana. In Weird. Guiana, I don't know why. It's like some uh, Da Vinci Code shit. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> or it's like it kind of reminds me when like in the seventies when people started moving back into Brooklyn after it had been kind of hollowed out, uh-huh. and they called themselves pioneers. There was a hipster that did that in Williamsburg like a few years ago. Oh, really? Yeah, he's like uh, sort of like a white older hipster talking to a yuppie. Jesus. A white guy. And he said, I literally like put it in like I colonized this so you could move in here and gentrify. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's But yeah, it's funny those like terms because there's like in the 70s that people would that where I'd come from, you know, whatever, Manhattan or whatever, like I'm coming back to Brooklyn and I'm like, I'm a pioneer. And the, what, the way they're saying it is that this is an empty land and I'm coming to right. cultivate it. So they're, they're wrong and they're... Imp- in their definition, but their impulse is correct that yes, you are a pioneer in the exact same way and yeah. you're misusing the term in the exact same way. Basically buoyed by material forces. Yeah. And yeah. pushing people out. Exactly. Also. Yeah. Yeah. Dispossessing people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's weird when sometimes people use symbols more correctly than they even intend to. Very bizarre. Yeah. So, I mean, we, uh, we went through the first 15 chapters in part one and we can start going through the uh, plot a little bit here. But uh, it's chapter 16, yeah. Elizabeth gives uh, Richard Jones a commission as sheriff. Richard is uh, cousins to Marmaduke Temple and very competitive with him. Um, he's who Marmaduke wants to get the deer for so we can say he killed it. Uh, in fact, he, he lies to him. Um, Richard Jones eventually figures out the truth. But now Richard Jones has this commission as sheriff. And then there's this thing because Jones has one of Marmaduke Temple's slaves on loan, Aggie. Uh, we talked about him like being promised Christmas presents if he, you know, keeps the deer secret. But uh, in this, he gives him like a he gives him a dollar coin, and Aggy like flips it up twenty feet in the air, and then ke- catches it perfectly on his palm. It's like it's very like the, here's a talented black person, and basically. Then, and then they uh, he like go and always discussing like how big his smile is and stuff like that. It's just it's it's gross. Um, What's interesting about this, though, is uh, so, yeah, like Richard gets the uh, commission sheriff. Um, immediately, he starts talking about his plans to systematize the county and then starts speculating on the race of certain people he doesn't quite trust. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say, uh, you know, this guy does his best as far as doing the voice for uh, Marmaduke's daughter, Elizabeth, who's giving him the sheriff commission. Yeah. You will find something to do. I have often heard you complain of old that there was nothing to do in this new country, while to my eyes it seemed as if everything remained to be done. Do? echoed Richard, who blew his nose, raised his little form to its greatest elevation, and looked serious. Everything depends on system, girl. I shall sit down this afternoon and systematize the county. I must have deputies, you know. I will divide the county into districts over which I will place my deputies, and I will have one for the village, which I will call my home department. Let me see. Oh, Benjamin, yes, will make a good deputy. He has been naturalized and would answer admirably 
if he could only ride on horseback. Yes, Mr. Sheriff, said his companion, and as he understands rope so well, he would be very expert should occasion happen. It's talking about Ben Pump, another of uh, Marmaduke's servants who uh, is basically a seafaring chap or a riverfaring chap. For his services in another way. No, interrupted the other. I flatter myself that no man could hang a man better than that is. Ah, oh, yes, Benjamin would do extremely well in such an unfortunate dilemma. It's interesting that they're, they're like, he's speculating on who can serve the state um, without, you know, reluctance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Benjamin comes to mind as, you know, he was a, um, a sort of a chain of command uh, at sea. Um but I think Richard is right to suspect him as not necessarily on the side of the uh, of the new developing bourgeois state. If he could be persuaded to attempt it. But should I despair of the thing, I could never induce him to hang or teach him to ride on horseback. I must seek another deputy. Well, sir, as you have abundant leisure for all these important affairs, I beg that you will forget that you are high sheriff and devote some little of your time to gallantry. Where are the beauties and improvements which you were to show me? Where? What? Everywhere. Here, I have laid out some new streets, and when they are open, and the trees felled, and they are all built up, will they not make a fine town? Well, Duke is a liberal-hearted fellow, with all his stubbornness. Yes, yes, I must have at least four deputies, besides a jailer. I see no streets in the direction of our walk, said Elizabeth. Unless you call the short avenues through these pine bushes by that name. Surely you do not contemplate building houses very soon in that forest before us and in those swamps. We must run our streets by the compass, cause, and disregard trees, hills, ponds, slumps, or in fact anything but posterity. Such is the will of your father, and your father, you know. Had made you sheriff, Mr. Jones, interrupted the lady, with a tone that said very plainly to the gentleman, that he was touching a forbidden subject. I know it, I know it, cried Richard, and if it were in my power, I'd make Duke a king. He's a noble-hearted fellow, and would make an excellent king. That is, if he had a good prime minister. Oh yeah, let's just go a little bit further to see what his first action is as a sheriff. But who have we here? Voices in the bushes, a combination about mischief? I'll wager my commission. Let us draw near and examine a little into the matter. During this dialogue, as the parties had kept in motion, Richard and his cousin advanced some distance from the house into the open space in the rear of the village, where, as may be gathered from the conversation, streets were planned and future dwellings contemplated, but where, in truth, the only mark of improvement that was to be seen was a neglected clearing along the skirt of a dark forest of mighty pines, over which the bushes or sprouts of the same tree had sprung up to a height that interspersed the fields of snow with little thickets of evergreen. The rushing of the wind, as it whistled through the tops of these mimic trees, prevented the footsteps of the pair from being heard while the branches concealed their persons. Thus aided, the listeners drew nigh to a spot where the young hunter, Leatherstocking, and the Indian chief were collected in an earnest consultation. The former was urgent in his manner, and seemed to think the subject of deep importance while Natty appeared to listen with more than his usual attention to what the other was saying. Mohican stood a little on one side, with his head sunken on his chest, his hair falling forward so as to conceal most of his features, and his whole attitude expressive of deep dejection, if not shame. "'Let us withdraw,' whispered Elizabeth. "'We are intruders, and can have no right to listen to the secrets of these men.' "'No right?' returned Richard, a little impatiently in the same tone, and drawing her arm so forcefully through his own as to prevent her retreat. You forget, cousin, that it is my duty to preserve the peace of the county, and see the laws executed. These wanderers frequently commit depredations, though I do not think John would do anything secretly. Poor fellow, he was quite boozy last night, and hardly seems to be over it yet. Let us draw nigher and hear what they say. Notwithstanding the so yeah, perfect cop, uh, basically <laughs> right off the top, uh, ready to just listen, oh, just run over civil liberties. Like, I need to hear what these guys are up to. I need to hear Oliver talk about his poverty and uh, and uh, Chingachgook or, I guess, uh, Indian John. And this, Let's see some ID. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, let's just hear what they have to say. We can yeah. get some into, gather some intelligence from these ne'er do wells. <laughs> yeah, you know, and like the thing they call him Indian John in this. I mean, if you go through the trouble of Christianizing your name, right? And then they put Indian in front of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, at the end, when his grave, his gravestone, the Chingachgook, which means great serpent, is misspelled, uh, which is a just, I mean, no respect really. Um, okay, yeah. Elizabeth eventually makes herself known and proposes a turkey shoot to the rest of the gang. Uh, that brings us to uh, chapter seventeen. And this is where we meet, uh, not meet, but start to see Billy Kirby as sort of the city-born urban Natty Bumpo. Or or he's almost like a sort of settler Paul Bunyan type figure. He can chop down you know, lots. He can move giant rocks. Just big, strong guy. Yeah. Uh, not afraid of anything. Um, and so basically the, uh, the shooters are going to be... Uh, Oliver's going to shoot one shoot um uh Natty and Billy Kirby. And I don't want to get too much into this uh chapter except to say that uh the, we also have the second black character in the in the novel and the first of Cooper's freeborn black characters or free black characters. The first one that's not a slave. It's Abraham Freeborn. This is his name. Uh, he's a proprietor of the turkey shoot, and turkey shoot basically like they take a turkey and tie it down. I can't remember if it's alive or dead, um, but its body is under a snowbank, so you can only shoot the uh, head. You can shoot the body, then uh, Abraham gets to keep the turkey. Definitely one of the stranger um, pastimes we've earmarked in 19th century fun. Yeah, it's not exactly. F- I mean, it's just like, can your gun shoot this far straight? Yeah, um, and yeah, I mean, it's I, I. I'm trying to put my finger on what I. I, I appreciate so the N word is all over this chapter, yeah. including Natty calling uh, Abraham the N word with the hard R. Yeah, uh, because he won't get out of the way because Natty Bumpo has been canceled. Basically, Natty tries to shoot, and the flint doesn't. It's, he miss the, the the gun misfires. It's not Natty's fault, and they have this argument over whether that should count as a shot or not. Yeah, uh, and Natty threatens to shoot Abraham if he doesn't <laughs> let him get another shot again. <laughs> And just imagine Cooper writing this being like, there's four more novels I got out of this guy. I can just, I yeah, can exactly. Tell. <laughs> like, it, it, I mean, maybe we should play some of that uh, portion here. His skin became mottled with large brown spots that fearfully sullied the light. And this is just so characteristic of 19th century uh, white novelists is to yeah. just get so fixated on the like, physiognomy of black people. Yeah, it's grotesque. I mean, it, it's quite literally grotesque. Right. I mean, yeah, the classic one is like darkening photos and stuff and like of uh, African-American people in like like their mug shots, like O.J. Simpson's like the most famous one. Right. It's grotesque, but it's also like there is an inheritance there. Like it's not like we're, we've made a clean break with this uh, type dude, of this, thinking. This is part of empire building, baby. Yeah. His skin became mottled with large brown spots that fearfully sullied the luster of his native ebony, while his enormous lips gradually compressed around two rows of ivory that had hitherto been shining in his visage like pearls set in jet. His nostrils, at all times the most conspicuous feature of his face, dilated until they covered the greater part of the diameter of his countenance, while his brown and bony hands unconsciously grasped the snow crust near him, the excitement of the moment completely overcoming his native dread of cold. While these indications of apprehension were exhibited in the sable owner of the turkey, the man who gave rise to this extraordinary emotion was as calm and collected as if there was not to be a single spectator of his skill. I was down in the Dutch settlements on the Skokery, said Natty, carefully removing the leather guard from the lock of his rifle, just before the breaking out of the last war, and there was a shooting match among the boys, so I took a hand. I think it opened a good many Dutch eyes that day when I won the powder horn, three bars of lead, and a pound of as good powder as ever flashed in pan. Lord, how they did swear in German. They did tell me of one drunken Dutchman who said he'd have the life of me before I got back to the lake again. But if he had put his rifle to his shoulder with evil intent, 
God would have punished him for it. And even if the Lord didn't, and he had missed his aim, I know one that would have given him as good as he sent, and better too, if good shooting could come into the count. By this time, the old hunter was ready for his business, and throwing his right leg far behind him, and stretching his left arm along the barrel of his piece, he raised it toward the bird. Every eye glanced rapidly for the marksman to the mark, but at the moment when each ear was expecting the report of the rifle, they were disappointed by the ticking sound of the flint. "'A snap! A snap!' shouted the negro, springing from his crouching posture like a madman before his bird. "'A snap! Good as fire! Natty Bumpo, gun the snap! Natty Bumpo, miss a turkey!' "'Natty Bumpo, hit a nigger!' said the indignant old hunter. If you don't get out of the way, Brom. Imagine that. would be a much different story. Everyone's <laughs> like, whoa, whoa, dude, what? Like Natty Bumpo spokesman. Like, I mean, you call himself that. If, if, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, oh, the, oh, oh, he can't say it. Yeah, he, he, in excitement that the sport produced in the others, though with a very different wish as to the result. While the woodchopper was slowly and steadily raising his rifle, That's he curvy. bawled. Fair, pl fair play, Billy Kirby, stand back. Make him stand back, boys. Give a nigger fair play. Pass up, gobbler. Shake a head, fool. Don't you see him taking aim? So I guess what the thing to take away from here is that even though his name is Abraham Freeborn and he's not a slave, yeah, he's still black. Yeah. And black people in this, they're infantilized. Unlike, you know, Chingachgook, who's basically the Rousseau noble savage. But the crazy thing about this is apparently the Jim Crow South thought uh cooper wasn't racist enough against black people because there's certain race there's nods towards race mixing in these novels but yeah. damn man like if this isn't racist enough for you well it reminds me not i'm for for greater context for these listeners you're gonna have to become a patron but it reminds me of the discussions we had of the orwell essays the most recent ones where mm -hmm. You would you would just assume like that Natty Bumpo Bumpo isn't um, like how could he possibly partake in this like um, uh, racism uh, and yet like you see people that are being affected by the Raj in Orwell's essay that are also gleefully participating in um, imperialist domination. Where it's just it's the it's a hierarchical society and it doesn't take long to get used to it. Basically, it's not something that's you know it's it's actually the anti it's it's the opposite of what all racist thing, which is actually not imprinted by birth or intrinsic. It's just something that you can get used to rather quickly. Mm -hmm. And the more that you're being submitted to this like imperialist will, you'll you will often like submit it unto other people because you have to find a way to make it as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, you re you reproduce it. I want to discuss, um, or just play a little bit from, this is called, from an essay called The Postcolonial Paradox of a Reimagined History in Cooper's The Pioneers by Nicole DeFee. It was presented at the Cooper Panel Number 1 of the 2008 Conference of the American Literature Association in San Francisco. Uh, have you read Franz Fanon? No. Uh, it shames me to say I haven't either. Uh, I need to do that. Um and uh, Nicole here uh, talks about this in relation to both um, Fanon and our boy uh, Richard Slotkin. In his work on the decolonization of Algeria, The Wretched of the Earth, Franz Fanon writes, The claim to a national culture in the past does not only rehabilitate that nation and serve as a justification for the hope of a future national culture. By a kind of perverted logic, it turns to the past of the oppressed people, and distorts, disfigures, and destroys it, 210. For Fanon, when a nation reaches the point where it looks to its own past, and not the colonizer's past, for that hope of a future national culture, that nation enters into what Fanon refers to as the second phase of decolonization. More than a century prior to Fanon's study, and on the other side of the Atlantic, antebellum Americans were engaged in a similar struggle. They, too, were attempting to forge a unique American culture that drew distinctly on American non-colonial history by turning to the past of the oppressed people and distorting, destroying, and disfiguring it. Few in antebellum American literature reimagined America's history better than James Fenimore Cooper. James Fenimore Cooper's The Leather Stocking Tales illustrates Fanon's second phase, 
where past happenings of the bygone days of his childhood will be brought up out of the depths of his memory, old legends will be reinterpreted. In the Leather Stocking Tales, Cooper attempts to develop a national culture, one that is unique to America and does not rely on the former colonizer to supplement its culture. Cooper re-examine E.S. his own past and heritage, his own perceptions of and role in the creation of the new American world. By setting three of the five novels in pre-revolutionary war history, Cooper can portray both the colonists and the Native Americans, most especially the Mohicans, as victims of colonial rule. He can unite them in a way that excludes the colonizer from the national American identity. However, to do so often blurs the line between the subject and the other and creates complex issues of identity that are not resolved in this second phase of the development of national identity and which are reflected in Cooper's novels. The Pioneers, more so than any of the other five novels of the Leather Stocking Tales, not only clearly illustrates how the collection mirrors the second phase of the decolonization process, but it also embodies issues central to post-colonial theory the complexities of location and privilege that have become paradoxical to discussions of post-colonial theory and literature today. Issues of race and citizenship are particularly prominent in and relevant to the post-colonial aspect of the novel as well as location and privilege. Whiteness in this novel guarantees neither citizenship nor an imagined citizenship in the community of the pioneers. However, what is present in the novel are complex negotiations of identity that are challenged throughout the text. These are not just challenges the characters encounter, but challenges confronting the newly independent nation as a whole. In the novel, the development of the national culture and the development of the national identity must confront three others, first, the most clearly identifiable other, the African American, second, the Native American, and the third, the European, primarily British, other. This other represents tyranny and colonialism. It represents what the country has recently fought against and won. However, it is the least clearly identifiable of the other because this other is European, racially and culturally. It is also an other with which the self can clearly identify, which is what makes this other hard to resist. While the development of the national identity's opposition of the first two others is crucial and central to an overall argument for considering the pioneers and the leather stocking tales as part of the conversation of post-colonial literature, my focus for this argument is on the third other, the European other. It is the least clearly identifiable other the antebellum Americans face, and the similarities between this other and the self is central to the issue of the post-colonial anxiety in the pioneers as well as to the development of the national identity. Cooper attempts to create in Natty Bumpo an identity that is neither imperial nor colonial, nor Native American, that appears to offer a clearly identifiable self. The Leather Stocking Tales establish the racial identity of Americans, by positing the Indians as not us in a general sense, and at the same time use Indians to represent specific alternatives to American society as it was presently constituted, Tompkins 111. However, Natty's liminal position is neither fully accepted by whites nor by Native Americans. Complicating his position is that on the one hand, Natty is clearly marked by whiteness, both in his looks and in his treatment of African Americans, on the other hand, from a cultural standpoint he is both white and Indian, Tompkins 115. The irreconcilable nature of these two identities, both as developed in the character of Natty and in the nation itself, figures most prominently in the pioneers as a post-colonial text. The, the problem is you can't make the case that he is showing a certain anxiety. I mean, maybe this, maybe he is showing a certain anxiety on Natty's part that he's not considered white. I don't know if that... But the problem is the rest, the context is immediate, the immediate context for is like the sort of racist description by the narrator of of Abraham's like face, for instance. Yeah, you could say that it's accurately portraying an anxiety at the time, whether it like necessarily like the author understood that anxiety or had a commentary on it, I guess would be our dividing line. It's like be, a J.D. No. Vance sort of thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, it Leather is. stuck in elegy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know what, yeah, you know what New York State needs is some VC or whatever the fuck is. Yeah. Uh, 
Isn't that his big thing? Is he's like what it need, what the, what Kentucky needs or wherever is venture capital. Yeah, everybody needs venture capital. Yeah, okay, it makes man. a lot of shit easier. Now he's like running for Congress or something. Oh, what a piece God. of shit. Yeah. Um. Anyways, we'll get to his book at <laughs> in like twenty years <laughs> no. time. Um. Yeah, there's something interesting about the contradiction in Natty Bumpo in this book in particular. It's like he's like the end. Like maybe maybe he's like archetypal of. This type of person that maybe have had to live in the frontier for like, you know, since the history of the colonies. Mm -hmm. And he's like the last of this kind of weird, contradictory lineage. Like the American, capital A American, no longer has to live this way anymore. That the contradictions have been teased out fully. And they're in the judge now. Yeah. Or a new in type a, of American. Is yeah. Coming. And they're in Elizabeth and they're not, mm-hmm. they don't have to make these kind of like compromises with uh, native peoples or, or with nature even. Right. That they're here to tame this, uh, this and frontier. Tame and commodify. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, but eventually Natty is given another shot uh, because I think Elizabeth gives him money for it. Yep. And then uh, Sheriff Richard uh, proposes a committee to regulate turkey shoots this is kind of a funny little satire on you know bureaucracy sticking their nose in to places. Yeah, well, it's like it, you would think it's like some kind of like frontier moment or something or like you know beyond society. Like this is how people get along, and but you can see this like encroaching uh, development of like codified laws, even in something as like social as a turkey shoot. Yeah. So uh, Marmaduke arrives at the turkey shoot area. He offers Oliver his assistant job um, because he's going to need to pick up the slack because Richard Jones was sort of filling that um, position earlier. And uh, Richard Jones speculates about his race. Um, And then Richard claims his own gentility, talks about, you know, um, his uncle and fathers and all that stuff. Um, Oliver accepts because uh, John Mohegan tells him to. He's uh, first inclined not to take it, but he is uh, impoverished and needs the cash. Chapter 19, uh, Elizabeth and uh, Louisa, her friend, talking about uh, Marmaduke Temple, Elizabeth da- Elizabeth's dad's forest taming, and Oliver's uh, race, <laughs> um, whether or not he might be you know, half-blood. Yeah. Um, Oliver you know, wants privacy. Uh, but then you you get a very strong, and this is also the case all over the spy of there's repre- like people are more noble than they are presenting, and certain characters, especially women, can always ascertain that. Yeah. Uh, chapter twenty, we get uh, you know discussions about sugar making. Uh, they ask Monsieur Lacroix about sugar making because he's a Martinique French you know guy who uh, is uh, exiled because of revolutions there. Um, LaCroix. Uh, chapter 21, Elizabeth asks kind of clumsily, like, hey, I know I've heard these stories many, many times before, Father, but can you tell me about the early days of settlement and how hard it was? Yeah. Which is like a very like clumsy way to get a character to tell anecdotes. Yeah. Right? Like, like, because then you get around that. Well, I you must have heard this story before. You're my daughter, <laughs> yeah. uh, whole element. Um, but talks about the starving times and seeing Natty. And then a tree falls and uh, Oliver saves uh, Louisa. Chapter twenty two is where it gets starts to get really interesting, as far as I am concerned. Uh, where there's giant swarms of pigeons, and here we'll return to the Alan uh, Taylor article uh, for a little bit on that. Enormous flocks of passenger pigeons were the most amazing spectacle of life's extraordinary vitality in the Otsego forest. No other species of bird in North America ever approached the numbers of passenger pigeons prior to their mass destruction in the 19th century, and extinction at the start of the 20th. The ornithologist A. W. Scourger estimates their peak population at 3 to 5 billion birds. They accounted for at least a quarter, and perhaps as many as two-fifths of the total bird population in the United States and Canada. 16 inches long with strong chests and long pointed wings, they were handsome, stately birds. The males were especially colorful, brilliant fiery orange eyes, a black bill, slate blue head, a neck resplendent with gold, green, and purplish crimson, a reddish brown breast, white belly, and a dark slate colored back and tail. Because they fed primarily on beech nuts and oak acorns, the pigeons frequented the hardwood forests of northern Pennsylvania and upstate New York. 
In North America no other bird species lived and migrated in such vast flocks of several million birds. The sight was doubly spectacular because of the rapidity of their flight 60 to 70 miles 272 per hour and the low altitude at which they flew, often just a few feet over the heads of the odd observers. Obscuring the sun by their numbers, they darkened the sky for hours, and sometimes in intermittent pulses for several days. Their drumming wings and cheerful cries of tweet, tweet accumulated into a din that drowned out all other sounds in the forest. The hail of their dropping dung filled the air with an acrid odor. The sight, sound, and smell alarmed men and beasts when they first witnessed a migrating flock. In 1796 the sky-darkening flocks that passed over Cooperstown led several elderly settlers to declare that they have seen more pigeons in one morning, the week past, than in their whole lives before. In his 1823 novel The Pioneers, James Fenimore Cooper described such a flock near Cooperstown, it extended from mountain to mountain in one solid blue mass, and the eye looked in vain over the southern hills to find its termination. In April and May the pigeons settled into extensive nesting grounds in the forest. They filled almost every tree with as many as 30 nests each one the home of an egg that hatched into a squab subsequently fattened on beech nuts and oak scorns that were gathered, consumed, and regurgitated by its parents. Branches snapped under the weight, dung piled up several inches deep on the ground, and the host trees often died from the ammonia accumulating at their roots. Alexander Wilson, an early 19th century naturalist, reported, the view through the woods presented a perpetual tumult of crowding and fluttering multitudes of pigeons, their wings roaring like thunder. In 1753 the Reverend Gideon Hawley, an Indian missionary, marveled at an Otsego nesting ground six to eight miles long where the wild pigeons breed in numbers almost infinite. In 1770 the surveyor Nathaniel Edwards stumbled upon an Otsego colony that was at least 20 miles long and 2 miles wide where every mature tree had at least 10 nests. <laughs> there was a mysterious allure in the unknown potential of a newly occupied wilderness. The possibility of unprecedented marvels heightened the imagination of the men who tried to make sense of their new surroundings. Otsego's leading land speculator, and the novelist's father, Judge William Cooper, insisted that moose occasionally interbred with cattle, one half cow, half moose belonging to an Otsego settler bore calves always inclined rather to browse upon the trees and shrubs, than to feed upon the grass. In 1797 the Cooperstown newspaper reported the sighting on Lake Canadarago of a serpent 15 feet long and as thick as a man's thigh, with a sharp horn set between its eyes. Okay, yeah, so we get into Breaking. cryptozoology, but <laughs> I... I love the like the idea of passenger pin pigeons, just uh -huh. giant mass of like I think the world was better like just in not saying anything about the state of humanity and civilization, but uh, the world was better when nature could do shit like that. Six what is it, six feet wide, six miles six wide. miles wide. Yeah, that's insane. And they would blot out the sun for days. Yeah, I mean, well, it gives greater context to the uh, great revival that's coming up. <laughs> yeah, so what? Uh, what the? Um, what uh, I love the way that Fenimore Cooper portrays this. So let's just get right to that. Arrows and missiles of every kind were in the midst of the flocks. They shoot them, and all. so numerous were the birds, and so low did they take their flight, that even long poles in the hands of those on the sides of the mountain were used to strike them to the earth. During all this time, Mister Jones, who disdained the humble and People just people just pulling them or like <laughs> smashing them out of the air with poles. Yeah. Even long poles in the hands of those on the sides of the mountain were used to strike them to the earth. During all this time, Mr. Jones, who disdained the humble and ordinary means of destruction used by his companions, was busily occupied, aided by Benjamin, in making arrangements for an assault of more than ordinarily fatal character. Among the relics of the old military excursions that occasionally are discovered. Okay, so the uh, top cop using uh, unused military equipment. Yeah. Throughout the different districts of the western part of New York. There had been found in Templeton, at its settlement, a small swivel, which would carry a ball of a pound weight. It was thought to have been deserted by a war party of the whites 
in one of their inroads into the Indian settlements, when perhaps convenience or their necessity induced them to leave such an encumbrance behind them in the woods. This miniature cannon had been released from the rust, and being mounted on little wheels was now in a state for actual service. For several years it was the sole organ for extraordinary rejoicings used in those mountains. On the mornings of the Fourth of July it would be heard ringing among the hills and even Captain Hollister, who was the highest authority in that part of the country on all such occasions, affirmed that, considering its dimensions, it was no despicable gun for a salute. It was somewhat the worse for the service it had performed, it is true, there being but a trifling difference in size between the touch-hole and the muzzle. Still, the grand conceptions of Richard had suggested the importance of such an instrument in hurling death at his nimble enemies. The swivel was dragged by a horse into a part of the open space that the sheriff thought most eligible for planning a battery of the kind, and Mr. Pump proceeded to load it. Several handfuls of duck-shot were placed on top of the powder, and the major domo announced that his piece was ready for service. The sight of such an implement collected all the idle spectators to the spot, who, being mostly boys, filled the air with cries of exultation and delight. The gun was pointed high, and Richard, holding a coal of fire in a pair of tongs, patiently took his seat on a stump, awaiting the appearance of a flock worthy of his notice. So prodigious was the number of the birds that the scattering fire of the guns with the hurling of missiles and the cries of the boys had no other effect than to break off small flocks from the immense masses that continued to dart along the valley, as if the whole of the feathered tribe were pouring through that one pass. None pretended to collect the game which lay scattered over the fields in such profusion as to cover the very ground with fluttering victims. Leatherstocking was a silent but uneasy spectator of all these proceedings, but was able to keep his sentiments to himself until he saw the introduction of the swivel into the sports. "'This comes of settling a country,' he said. "'Here I have known the pigeon to fly for forty long years, and, till you made your clearings, there was nobody to skirt or to hurt them.' This comes from settling a country is maybe the the ultimate line in the leather stocking tales so, so far that I've read, as far as a message of and, and Natty's judgment of basically the white people, the white dispossesses that come after him. That still resonates today, like mm-hmm. the amount of you know the way you know the U.S. Army comes from this time period, uh, uh, basically Indian. Um, there's the great, uh, the autumn of the black snake. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. William Hoagland. But like, there's so many, and, and attitudes that were set by settlement. And I mean, Natty's obviously a part of settlement himself. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have a lot of this in my, in my, we've touched briefly on my hunting background, but like my dad is very, um, uh, strict about this sort of ethicality and fair chase and that sort of thing. Um, you know, don't shoot animals with like you know special types of ammunition or things you can like shoot it out of a helicopter, for instance, like that. Right? Like like things like uh, Donald Trump Jr. would love to do. Yeah. And like there is, I mean, right now in my freezer there is literal like deer sausage and and things like that oh, really? like, yeah this the natty bumpo sort of like live off the land subsistence thing has lived on in this country to this day but also i think the the actual things that come from settlement right like the actual the settler thing like when i think of um the way marmaduke temple talks about taming the wilderness like we talked about earlier with the gentrification and pioneer like I think of DeKalb Mall, yes. or whatever that place is, right? Like that's With the Target and the Alamo Draft House. Yeah, like that's where all this was leading to. Yeah, that's the terminal point for this. It's giant corporate complexes with like an Apple Store in them and a yeah. Whole Foods, and maybe some luxury apartments on top. That's the ultimate like tamed nature. Yeah, and I I think that that's what Cooper touches on. When I don't. There's some like the story is about this transition state, right, between this kind of frontier lifestyle to a more codified, uh, I don't want to say industrial, but a more urban setting where not only are there like or privatized, yeah, privatized is probably the best word because it's not just about houses, it's like it's it's the lineage of houses that are being introduced and property rights essentially. 
and you could say that maybe there's that there's no implicit criti- implicit criticism of that but i think what cooper is trying to say or at least the story is trying to say is that the the there's a temptation in that move towards codifying and towards making like a common law that you it want it wants you to reach towards excess and you have to find a way to curb that impulse because that impulse to like just keep like once you've grabbed something to grab something else in this story's like in this story's ethos that's the thing that will destroy you or like it's it's almost like it's written into the dna of of founding some sort of like codifying some sort of settlement is that what you have to be able to be fine with it in a way that like i feel like judge templeton is almost like the the archetypal character of someone who's like passion he cares about justice but is also disinterested and doesn't want to reach beyond his bounds in a way where it's like he's the in a way that marmaduke is the one who's like he's the future unfortunately (laughs) And he's gonna, and that's that's the one who's gonna take advantage of the worst impulses of this scenario. Or, or like I, one of the essays, I, I think he rationalizes them. He's a yeah, chief yeah. rationalizer yeah. ever. And so I think I have the part here. Um, uh, basically, in the next chapter, a similar thing happens with fish, and they sane or sane. It's spelled like the French river. S e i n e. Yeah, sane. Uh, the the river, um, which is basically like you take a giant sort of tennis net looking thing and uh, drape it across the river so water starts flowing through it and fish start getting trapped in it and then you bring the nets the ends together upstream so it creates a little like a circle yeah and you trap a lot of fish that way and uh, this is also another thing true from history apparently this was uh something that was done um and that as mentioned in the earlier chapter when they're talking about the jacobins the french people uh regulated this Mm-hmm. Um and here they're just doing it willy nilly out in uh, Templeton, um and Natty is asked to maybe take some of the extra fish and he we'll see what how he reacts here, with emotions so graceful and yet so rapid that it seemed to possess the power of regulating its own progress. The water in front of the canoe was hardly ruffled by its passage and no sound betrayed the collision, when the light fabric shot on the gravelly beach for nearly half its length, Natty receding a step or two from its bow in order to facilitate the landing. "'Approach, Mohegan,' said Marmaduke. "'Approach, Leatherstocking, and load your canoe with bass. It would be a shame to assail the animals with the spear, when such multitudes of victims lie here, that will be lost as food for the want of mouths to consume them.' "'No, no, Judge,' returned Natty, his tall figure stalking over the narrow beach and ascending to the little grassy bottom where the fish were laid in piles. "'I eat of no man's wasty ways.' I strike my spear into the eels or the trout when I crave the creature. But I wouldn't be helping to such a sinful kind of fishing for the best rifle that was ever brought out from the old countries. If they had fur like the beaver, or you could tan their hides like a buck, something might be said in favor of taking them by the thousand with your nets. But as God made them for man's food, and for no other discernible reason, I call it sinful and wasty to catch more than can be eat." Your reasoning is mine. For once, old hunter, we agree in opinion, and I heartily wish we could make a convert of the sheriff. A net of half the size of this would supply the whole village with fish for a week at one haul. The leather stocking did not relish this alliance in sentiment, and he shook his head doubtingly as he answered, No, no, we are not much of one mind, judge, or you'd never turn good hunting grounds into stumpy pastures. And you fish and hunt out of rule. But, to me, the flesh is sweeter where the creature has some chance for its life. For that reason, I always use a single ball, even if it be at a bird or a squirrel. Besides, it saves lead. For when a body knows how to shoot, one piece of lead is enough for all, except hard-lived animals. The sheriff heard these opinions with great indignation and when he completed the last arrangement for the division by carrying with his own hands a trout of a large size and placing it on four different piles in succession as his vacillating ideas of justice required gave vent to his spleen a very pretty confederacy indeed judge temple the landlord and owner of a township with nathaniel bumpo a lawless squatter and professed deer-killer in order to preserve the game of the county but duke when i fish i fish 
So away, boys, for another haul, and we'll send out wagons and carts in the morning to bring in our prizes. Marmaduke appeared to understand that all opposition to the will of the sheriff would be useless, and he strolled from the fire to the place where the canoe of the hunters lay, whither the ladies and Oliver Edwards had already preceded him. Curiosity induced the females to approach this spot. Yeah, so Nadia rejects the fish. Um... It's interesting that Judge tries to find that as some sort of way for them, Judge Templeton, as a way for them to connect. Well, it's it, it's it's interesting, yeah, because Templeton sees this as basically a capitalist opportunity um, the, the, for the surplus, right? Yeah. Like, this is surplus. We can use this to um, provide for the people, for instance. Yeah. And um, that's something that uh, William Cooper, the real William Cooper, did for, you know, I think there were actually were tough times and that he had to provide for people like for the first couple of uh, of years out on the frontier, like the first winters, basically. But, and, and Natty has none of it. Even though the fish are there, he would rather they were killed skillfully by, you know, John Mohegan mm-hmm. than just eat the fish that are already just sitting there. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, I mean, clearly principled thing. Yeah. Stan that he's making. And I do think it, it is, re- it's related to how comfortable you are with, uh, you know, economic activity directed at a surplus. The birds too, like there are all these birds lying around. So Templeton creates a sort of incentive for picking them up and like wringing their necks or taking their heads off basically. Mm-hmm. Do you mind if I go on a slight digression? But, um, I'm curious. If there's something. I reread the book and then I made some notes thinking about like uh, Judge Templeton's place all the, and all this. And it could be because I've just watched the Democratic debates recently because I don't value my time. Uh, yeah. But I've noticed that there's this like there's this demarcation line between like the system itself is corrupt and then the more uh, centrist one now is like capitalism works but it's like it's people who've gotten greedy in the system so they're just adopting the crony capitalism yeah yeah that that thing yeah Yeah, like uh kamala harris and the other ones who have had to drop out now are are really into saying that and it kind of reminds me of judge templeton's thing which he's like he's like his argument or his, his attempt to connect with natty bumpo is like he's like yeah you know i don't think we should be doing it to excess either it's like i'm just trying to get like a slight surplus here yeah and i mean there's another element of this that i think is insidious where it's he's always just sort of driven by the will of the people this is similar to shooting an elephant really actually yeah. uh check out the patron if you want to get those episodes you're probably like george orwell like, thing. You probably i don't need know, this context like, what am i what am i missing about this but Everything. actually this is actually a very tidy connection because um this is problematic for a similar reason we said orwell was problematic in that you know it's this is the people driving the official actor to do something and then sort of rationalize it yeah along lines that uh sort of defend the legitimacy of the state and so you know we slaughter a whole bunch of birds but there's also a, 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 a you slaughter a whole bunch of birds kill a whole bunch of fish you know as we talked about in the first part you know we either burn trees for potash or we tap them for maple the other thing is you have the elite sort of which is dangerous is the dangerous for our time now which is you don't want it to look like the elites are the ones pushing uh you know climate change responses for instance like kamala harris talking about straw banning straws right? right like we need to talk about the economic system more than um that so in marmaduke temple you have the guy who he can get caught up in the moment with like the bird shooting or the fishing but he also he sees natty's point and especially with his maple trees he understands that this is a resource that can be exhausted mm-hmm. and that's sort of like the teddy roosevelt school of conservation right yeah like the where the elites say like i mean that was also part of an imperial project of, you know, finally taking the rest of the Native American lands. Let's be real about a lot of that stuff. But, but yeah, like the, the, that through line of he's sort of taking over the role of like the, the king 
in England who like preach restraint to the settlers, like right, don't settle west of the Appalachians, yeah, right, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's like now, like you built this entire mechanism of a society where it's like it rewards excess, but it's like now you just have to like as long as we everyone has personal view, virtue that has no intrinsic reward, we'll be fine. Right. Uh, we move on to chapter twenty-five. Marmaduke's been up all night because he got a mysterious letter, a ship letter from London. Uh, and must devote the rest of the day to writing, which I thought was an interesting touch. Like when you had to write freehand, we everybody talks about having to answer email. Yeah, but it's like, oh, I get, I'm gonna have to be in my office for eight hours <laughs> writing different letters to people. Yeah, because it's all freehand. There's no cut and paste. It's true. Um, tough times. Turns out everything is fine now. You could only. I mean, this is a material point of uh, print: is that you had to have, for instance, like Marmaduke servants to be able to have the free time to write. And then we move on to chapter 26, where Louisa and Elizabeth uh, turn down Oliver's offer of assistance and protection as they go for a walk in the hills. Uh, they said they have their dog instead, which a big mistake. <laughs> um, uh, so instead, Oliver goes to find uh, Natty, go, gets to Natty's house, sees his dogs there, leashed up, uh, sees Hiram Doolittle, a functionary, basically deputy of yep. uh, Richard Jones. Uh, unsure what he's doing there. Very suspicious. Um, and then he meet, later meets up with Natty. I want to play this part where he Natty tells him about a place that's not mentioned in any book, and it sort of blows his mind a little bit. Um, because I think it's interesting in the internet age to look back at sort of uh, the limitations of what was printable or accessible by print. There the water comes crooking and winding among the rocks, first so slow that a trout could swim in it and then starting and running like a creature that wanted to make a far spring, till it gets to where the mountain divides like the cleft hoof of a deer, leaving a deep hollow for the brook to tumble into. The first pitch is nigh two hundred feet, and the water looks like flakes of driven snow afore it touches the bottom, and there the stream gathers itself together again for a new start, and maybe flutters over fifty feet of flat rock before it falls for another hundred when it jumps about from shelf to shelf, first turning this away and then turning that away, striving to get out of the hollow, till it finally comes to the plain. I have never heard of this spot before. It is not mentioned in the books. I never read a book in my life, said Leatherstocking, and how should a man who has lived in towns and schools know anything about the wonders of the woods? No, no, lad. There has that little stream of water been playing among the hills since he made the world, and not a dozen white men have ever laid eyes on it. The rock sweeps like mason work in a half round, on both sides of the fall, and shelves over the bottom for fifty feet, so that when I've been sitting at the foot of the first pitch, and my hounds have run into the caverns behind the sheet of water, they've looked no bigger than so many rabbits. To my judgment, lad, it's the best piece of work that I've met in the woods. And none know how often the hand of God is seen in the wilderness. Yeah, I just love the Oliver's, like, I haven't read about this. Mm -hmm. uh, which also betrays his suppressed nobility, right? He's not just poor, a, a poor woodsman. He has some education behind him, so he's clearly done a lot of reading. Yeah. Um, but uh, and so he's a book-learning type of guy. Well, and also that... Bumpo knows how intimately he knows the natural world. Yeah. That he he wouldn't even, like, a book would be no use to him, basically. Yeah. That's how well he's, like, accustomed to the natural changing of the world. Which is like, okay, I'll go look that up on Google Maps now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, uh, so, a a as they're reminiscing about this stuff, we're talking about the woods... Uh, they hear Natty's dogs, which are somehow loose, and they're chasing a deer. And so they start chasing the deer, uh, too. Chapter 27, Oliver, Oliver tries to remind Natty and uh, John Mohegan that it's not deer season, mm -hmm. so they should not kill this deer, but they're excited uh, by the chase. So they do go and kill it in the middle of the river, slitting its throat. Not good. Uh, tough stuff. Um, then they get back to their to Natty's hut, and they're wondering why the dogs were loose. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Chingachgook goes CSI Templeton on him <laughs> and finds out the leashes were cut by a knife. Yeah. And also, it looks like they were trying to get... So whoever was there, who we know was Hiram Doodle. Yeah. Uh, whoever was there tried to get into the house as well but we're told a number of times that natty keeps his hut locked which is suspicious at that time why does he do that why does he do that when he's hanging out with racially ambiguous people like oliver and john mohegan doesn't need books doesn't need any kind of learning we but need to get in there that's why that's why you know we need we need the warrant so we, we continue but we don't have a warrant yet so chapter 28 elizabeth and louisa again talk about oliver's suppress nobility and how they can see something in him um brave the dog the dog that they chose to protect them instead of oliver comes to their rescue when a panther a painter attacks them dog died i thought this was actually a sad section yeah. it's very which is very sentimental but like i didn't i don't want the dogs to die dog dead it's fair but then natty eventually comes in and saves them and then Doolittle's like You've been killing stuff today? He's like, just a panther. But deep down, it's like, no, I've been killing a lot of stuff. And Doolittle confronts him. Natty's like, what are you going to do? I have a dog and a gun right here. Mm -hmm. Chapter 29, uh, we go to, we see Marmaduke and Richard discussing, you know, who Richard's deputies might be. Richard is has more racist suspicions about uh, Natty, Oliver, and John, and whether they're not mining um secretly silver he says he has good information can't tell where which is a very uh joseph mccarthy move yeah it reminds me like when when you're like in being interrogated by the police like we know you're there but they don't have that proof they're just waiting for you to admit it yeah but uh we'll find out where that proof comes from and it's not a very reliable source um similar to uh you know sort of iraq war uh, (laughs) lies um uh, but he's like, you know, as they go rich, you go poor. They're out, getting silver out there. Um, you know, why else would they be locking their huts? Chapter 30, Doolittle comes and requests a warrant. And Marmaduke signs one to get into Natty's uh, hut. And Doolittle enlists Billy Kirby, the uh, sort of Paul Bunyan-esque lumberjack, woods cutter, all-arounder. And but he enlists him, and Kirby's like, "Wait, who are you going to get in the woods?" Mm-hmm. And is and uh, uh, Doolittle's like, "I can't tell you until you say yes." <laughs> and Kirby does say yes. And there's, a, I want to play this bit: "Land Ownership and Representation of Social Conflict in the Pioneers" by Douglas Buckholtz, presented at the Seventh Cooper Seminar in 1989, and it talks about middle of the road status and how. Natty and Billy Kirby are sort of like the urban and ex-urban or rural uh, mirror of each other. And although Billy Kirby is definitely more uh, implicated and involved in a capitalist mode of production. Edward's middle-of-the-road status is further developed during the several months he remains in the Temple House. While he has the appearance of the frontier hunter and has been one in the recent past, his speech and manners suggest an upper-class origin. Significantly for the themes and conflicts of the Leatherstocking Tales as a whole, the Temple family and some of the townspeople of Templeton suspect that he is of mixed white and Indian race. This is an impression which whites often receive from Natty Bumpo as well because of his sunburned features and semi-savage manner of living. Edwards is inexplicably cold to the attentions of Judge Temple and his attractive, intelligent daughter, he thus begins to acquire the aura, by now familiar to readers of Cooper's fiction, of concealed identity. Edwards, Natty and Ching Achgook are established hunting companions, and spend much time together in the woods even while Edwards is living with the temples. The textual role of their middle-of-the-road status becomes apparent in the novel through a series of apparently ordinary, yet dramatically and thematically concentrated incidents which occur in the frontier village during the month succeeding Edwards' injury. All of these incidents involve misuse of the natural resources of the Otsego Lake region, and in each case Judge Temple intervenes in the role of regulator and rationalizer of these abuses, There's Robinson. The, the first such incident involves Natty Bumpo's frequent objections to the wholesale clearing of forests. 
the rapid settlement and agricultural development of the New York frontier during the period of the novel has given rise to a socio-economic stratum of professional woodcutters, represented in the novel by the powerful and blunt Billy Kirby. Kirby and Natty Bumpo carry on a friendly but intense rivalry during the early parts of the novel, although Natty's later victimization by the representatives of bourgeois society makes Kirby his ally. The early dispute between Kirby and Natty takes the characteristic form of a shooting match, which Natty wins, but it is rooted in the socio-economic structure of the New York frontier, which thus conditions even relatively peripheral conflicts in the novel. While Natty Bumpo is a subsistence hunter and occasional guide, closely connected by occupation as well as ideology with the indigenous tribes, and dependent like them on unrestricted use of large tracts of land, Billy Kirby is a semi-proletarian, dependent on capitalist development and labor and commodity markets. Besides working as a woodchopper for farmers clearing their land, he produces maple products in season, and sells them to the townspeople. Despite their superficial similarities, therefore, Natty's and Billy's personal dispute is based on a fundamental class division. Judge Temple's relation to the dispute between Natty and Billy clarifies its socio-economic origins. In response to Natty's frequent complaints about the destruction of the hunting grounds around Otsego Lake by Kirby's activities, Temple proposes not to curtail, but to systematize and regulate these activities. In keeping with his bourgeois status, Judge Temple is particularly interested in promoting the commodification of timber and maple products, and has plans for improved communication and transportation systems to accomplish this goal. It is obvious, then, that the Billy Kirby Judge Temple Natty Bumpo conflict over use of the land has more socio historically extensive dimensions than would a merely personal dispute. It is important to the dramatic conflict of the novel however and ultimately to Cooper's status as a socio-historical realist that this conflict is never simplified or rendered abstractly. While in socio-historical terms, the Billy Kirby Judge Temple Natty Bumpo conflict encapsulates the overall struggle in early American society between subsistence hunters and farmers, Indian and white, that is, the nascent proletariat and the bourgeoisie, it always appears in the novel as a dispute between just these representatives of their classes. The reader experiences the dispute, as do the novel's characters, from within as a collision of opposing kinds of work, domesticity, affection, self-regard, and so on. The central conflict over use of the land in the pioneers develops through subsequent incidents exemplifying the waste and economic irrationality attendant on capitalist development. During the annual migration of passenger pigeons through the Otsego Lake region, the townspeople appear armed with every available weapon, resulting in a senseless slaughter on which the subsistence hunter Natty Bumpo looks with sadness and disgust. The most destructive role in this, as in later such incidents, is played by Sheriff Jones, Judge Temple's cousin and a tragic comic type of the emerging bourgeois petty official. Sheriff Jones exemplifies Cooper's success in the leather-stocking tales in utilizing peripheral comic characters. He carries Judge Temple's bourgeois qualities to ludicrous extremes, as becomes evident through a friendly rivalry between the cousins which parallels that between Hilly Kirby and Natty Bumpo. Sheriff Jones is not merely ridiculous, however. For example, Judge Temple is forced continually to compensate for his cousin's excesses excesses which he himself has promoted by having Jones appointed sheriff. During the pigeon shooting incident, Sheriff Jones, not satisfied with the destructive effect of smaller arms, trains a small, mobile cannon on the migrating flock, with predictable results. The great masses of dead birds are of no practical use to the townspeople, as Natty Bumpo trenchantly observes. Judge Temple, as usual, does not object in principle to the waste of resources, but seeks to organize it along capitalist lines. He offers children of the town a bounty for the dead birds' heads, and thus sees to the disposal of the surplus. Not, not that you necessarily are going to agree with who Cooper sides with in this stuff, but that he represents all these different elements of class and race, and how and it sort of it's like a time capsule of how people viewed this stuff at the time, or at least um, elites. 
Yeah, I think that's probably the book's greatest strength and maybe even staying power for future readers is that like a point of view or or a message isn't necessarily as clear or, or if you parse it, you may not get exactly what something that's as fulfilling as you'd want. But I do think in the way that in the Flaubert sense where he says like the artist's role is not to change the world, but to know the world. Mm-hmm. I think he does take that charge up rather seriously, Cooper, as to truly try to render reality, not necessarily like physical reality, but the actual, uh, relationships between people as accurately as possible and i think this book succeeds in that probably more than any other book that we've read so far in our project uh, yeah i agree chapter 30 he uh doolittle gets a warrant from marmaduke enlists kirby uh to go confront natty and when they get to natty's hut uh kirby does confront him in a very polite uh you know i'm just doing this because this is my duty as a citizen yep sort of way uh but as soon as natty picks up his gun or points his gun do little and uh i think it's jotham riddle uh f off <laughs> they flee yeah. and kirby's like i think you scared him off and then they get along because they're you know members of the they're, they're workers basically or not i guess no that's not even technically true uh natty's sort of what would natty be in the marxist context is that is he like he'd be uh he'd be is he a peasant yeah, because he'd be a he'd be a farmer on free land or whatever, or not uh, not a farmer, but uh, those people that would gather food from com common land, right? Everyday man solidarity, I guess. Yeah, um, sort of thing going on. In chapter thirty one, Natty's menacing those guys with his gun really upsets Marmaduke. He says, "For this have I tamed the wilderness," which is a very grandiose thing for him to say. You know, considering like how tame really is it. Um, how much did he actually do yeah exactly this but particularly when you know um it was owned by the effingham family before <laughs> him yeah uh, which i'll uh, come back later and uh chapter 32 they go to serve the warrant and natty has burned his own house down no nope, yeah. you're not going to get into my house he, he uh scolds them chapter 33 he's brought to trial for that it's it's this sort of thing where he's like you know i saved your daughter judge from a panther you're not gonna let me off and judge is like i can't think about things like that i just gotta do justice as justice needs to be served and the law is the law and those sorts of things what a sick card to have in your back pocket yeah i did save your daughter from a panther and kirby's like kirby's not given the prosecution what they want initially mm-hmm. he's like you know i didn't i wasn't scared of natty he seems <laughs> fine with me like you know whatever and then eventually um, he's reminded, like, you know, you're supposed to be helpful on us, buddy. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's a he's a slightly more, um, for uh, you know, helpful to them. Um, and Natty gets sentenced to jail. Um, Stocks, right? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it's exactly. So Natty's stockaded. Um, he's like, you're going to stockade? I was a vet. Um, that <laughs> doesn't get him out of stockades. Uh, ben Pump, the other servant of Marmaduke Temple, joins him in the stockades. And then um, just urge, accompanies him around the stockades. Uh, and then uh, Doolittle is uh, mocking uh, Natty. So Ben Pump beats him up and then Ben Pump gets put in the stockades next to him. Uh, chapter 35, they talk, Marmaduke talks to Elizabeth who doesn't like that she had to, uh, that he punished Natty. And he says, thou talkest as a woman. Uh but nonetheless, gives her two thousand dollars to go basically pay Natty's. Yep. So we gotta we gotta uphold the law. But I can you know pay for him. There's a separate rich people thing where you pay enough money, you can get out of prison early. Well, it's interesting because especially I feel like the pantomime that is that trial, like it's it's clearly underlined that this is not a uh, like the blind arbiter of law is not necessarily sacrosanct in this trial. Right. And so it leads the reader to question what exactly is, uh, Bumpo, Netty Bumpo's crime. And the crime is that he's not submitting to this like communal authority. He has Mm -hmm. this like personal moral charter that that's what he's following. And I think the burning down of the house is, is one step too far, which is like, we told you to do this and you're not listening. And mm-hmm. that's what that's what puts him in the stocks more than anything else. I feel like, and so for like Judge Temple uh, Templeton, he knows that he didn't do anything wrong, like morally, 
but ethically did so it's like there's not there's no problem in getting him off since i have the means to do that yeah and you know it's when natty's sentence he's like where am i going to get the money from and kind of a emotional scene and in this chapter here in chapter 35 um marmaduke's like here elizabeth just here's the money to you know go pay for you know, that part of the fine for yeah. killing the deer and so she goes and talks to him and he's like uh not only am I going to break out of here, so not need <laughs> your money or anything. Yeah. Uh, can you please go buy gunpowder with that? Yeah. <laughs> but it is to kill beavers, so it's not to like go on a. I I had a I had a weird thought that maybe like there was a different ending to this that Cooper censored. That yeah. when he says go get the gunpowder, and then later it, um, we have a whole mountain on fire that actually was a giant terrorist attack on the yeah, mountain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, which just, has been pretty dope. He's going to bring down the temple with yeah, himself. I'm and going inside. to burn Mount Vision. With, yeah. Um, but anyway, that's not what happened. But uh, in my secret version, that's what happened. Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, Elizabeth offers uh, Natty the $200 and for ease and plenty. We want you to live in ease and plenty, not, you know, have to owe the state $200. Yeah. And uh, Natty's like, yeah, give me gunpowder. Uh, the other thing is, is so jailbreaks were a common occurrence in uh, in Cooperstown. Mm. Um and Cooperstown this is, specifically. And you could actually put this on William Cooper because he hastily uh, constructed a courthouse uh, <laughs> so that Cooperstown would be the county seat over mm. uh, more developed other cities uh, in the area. I think Cherry Valley um, or Cherry Valley, one of the two, was more, you know, made more sense. But he's like, well, I already made one <laughs> by the time uh, ses- the, the state you know, assembly or whatever the hell it's called, got back in order. And it's like, I guess we'll give it to William Cooper. Um, That's so, so funny. He, yeah. Ask permission later, I guess. Chapter 36, uh, Elizabeth gets the gunpowder. Uh, she decides to take it up alone because Luis is still scarred from the Panther thing. Comes across uh, John Mohegan basically chanting and going through a sort of de- pre-death ritual, basically. And it's very there's sort of like a King Lear element here where he have he's mentioned as um, a representative of the rightful owners of the land uh, in mm-hmm. the in the you know chapter where he, um, they're at the bar and it's compared with you know dis, uh, beheading a king is like you know getting rid of the Native Americans um, and so he's going through this ritual and the and his land is also uh, in trouble too because it start this massive fire starts. Um, and uh, Oliver comes to try to save her, but they're not. Oh, the, another thing is, is this fire starts because of uh, wasted trees. So we have another waste uh, element. There's all this kindling that's just sitting around there that's been baking under the sun. Um, Oliver tries to save it. Um, Natty eventually comes to save the day. They uh, take refuge in a cave where uh, John Mohegan dies, uh, renouncing Christianity, much to Mr. Grant's displeasure and uh oliver rushes uh elizabeth out of the cave because there's something there he doesn't want her to see but he says the moment of concealment is over and so what does that mean well um we'll find out after chapter 39 where richard jones enlists the infantry because he actually does suspect that natty set the mountain on fire um that infantry is turned back uh natty shoots Doolittle in the ass um, Temple calls for a halt as Oliver surrenders. And then we find out that Oliver is ac- actually Edward Oliver Effingham, the grandson of Major Effingham, or Fire Eater, who has been in Natty's hut until he burned it down and now is in the cave. And uh, we find out that uh, you know he's been there for a while. He was presumed dead. And then we later find out that um, that's what Marmaduke thought. This was the guy Marmaduke was friends with. Um, um, and, uh, you know, I guess took the land from. Yeah. Um, and But it turns out that Marmaduke actually had, didn't just take this all the stuff that was repossessed. He's been holding it in a trust. Um, and he didn't want anyone to know because he wanted to uh, wanted the FNMs to be able to apply to the crown for their rec- uh, their compensation, which was allowed to... Uh, loyalists who were who lost their land in the American Revolution, which is double dipping, right? <laughs> yeah, true. So, like, 
I want you'll be able to get this. This I'm going to keep this all this property in a trust, and also get the money from the queen. Yeah. Um. So thanks for that little. Just corruption is a good part of the uh, the resolution here. Um, yeah. Nothing says solidarity with a monarch than corruption. <laughs> Land yeah, corruption. I mean, and what is uh, what is uh. Old Major Effingham think about that. Like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm gl- glad I got the money. I mean, take the mo- well, it's the empire, whatever. Um, but yeah, so uh, um, and I'll, I mean, to be honest, the, that kind of plot, the whole European plot of like, will the Effingham's and Temple? It's convoluted. It's tacked yeah. on. Um, but then uh, we also find out that Natty was. Uh, Major Effingham's servant for a long time before, and actually, when Temple came and saw Natty's hut, Natty was basically a servant for Effingham at the time. Yeah, which puts Natty in a different context slightly. He's less of a individualist wild man or man of the wild, and he was a servant for a royalist guy. Yeah, his like archetype is much more recently made than you would assume. You'd assume that he was like raised by wolves or something. And there's almost an element where, like, we're told that Natty was a faithful servant as if that's supposed to make him better seeming to us. But it actually, to me, it's like it makes him less interesting. He's not oh, this really? American individual. Uh, he who was like, it, to me, a more interesting American individualist type of, let's say, of a, I was a libertarian that wanted to believe in this. Sort yeah, of thing. if. It would be a trader who had, like, his own boat and, like, you know, got his own supplies and like whatever, right? Like it wouldn't yeah. be this guy who was the landlord or not landlord, but like the groundskeeper for a, you know, a, a, a nabob a colonizer, Effingham, who like had a bunch of land because he was, you know, in tight with the king. Yeah, I guess I think that's what makes Natty more interesting for me, though, is I think uh-huh. that like, that Natty, not too dissimilar from the spy novel, is just a series of projections. Mm-hmm. And that might be like the most salient point about the American story is that you can walk into a room and you can be who you choose to be. That's obviously not true. But there are certain people that can take advantage of that to a certain degree. And I think that like when you look at the way that like Natty treats uh, uh, the freed uh, African American, or yeah. the way that he's like, I've never read a book. Is right. he's projecting his personality as hard as he can onto other people, so they know that, like, oh wow, he must have literally grew up like you know, in dirt or something. But really, it's yeah. not true. He's like actually like he's very close to uh, gentility. Yeah, he, I mean, one of the greater enigmas. I think you could use that uh, phrase as a, as a character as any in American literature, at least that we've seen so far. Yeah. Like you don't really know. He's almost like a proto Gatsby kind of character mm. where he just kind of is like, he's has this past that suits him at any given moment. Like his, his past story is whatever he wants it to be to impress or to get something out of someone else. Yeah. I'm curious what you thought about like, when I was reading it, I noticed there was a number. When I was reading the book for a second time, I, knew, I noticed there was a couple of different references to um, Solomon and the biblical character, and that's the son of David, who's the second monarch of Israel. And that's like a real turning point in um, the Old Testament story of moving the Jewish people away from a more nomadic existence into a more set and codified existence. And the the uh, pinnacle of that is Solomon's creation of his temple, which, of course, uh, Judge Templeton is like, that's his namesake. Templeton, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that the deer slaying incident, or the, the argument that the book opens with over who killed the deer is like a pretty good American facsimile of the... Um, the two women coming to Solomon with a baby saying like, which baby's mine? And he's like, cut the baby in half. And right. then the one psycho is like, great, cut it in half. Yeah. <laughs> we find out that, it, that she's obviously not the mom. Yeah. It is a, it is a definitely a very American spin to have, let's say the, the Solomon character or temple. Yeah. Uh, to be like, I'm going to have some of that baby too. Right. I get some of that baby. Is that right? Like, yeah. Yeah. You exactly. Split up the baby. But I'm gonna. I get some. We all right? listen. We're all gonna get our piece. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The American way is cut it into ten ways. Yeah. With um, like yeah yeah. 
But it got me thinking about like Cooper's approach to this, like the themes of this novel. And it's this like idea, like it, it, with that framing in mind, like the idea that this is a transition moment that it almost obliterates any like racial difference between native Americans and, uh, um, uh, colonial Americans, that they're actually two different modes of existence and one is out phasing the other. Mm-hmm. And that, um, it, it really changed the context of the way that the book writes about nature because nature is so um, like to struggle against like the changing of the seasons, for example, is uh, uh, futile almost in the way that like uh, I think Natty Bumpo gets a few victories at the end of this, but they're personal victories and they're, they get shorter and shorter each yeah. time that he's been outmoded and like his whole lifestyle is being curbed at every instance. And, it's almost like that there's like a fate to it that like the way that the way that this society is being created and codified with these like laws and restrictions is like in Cooper's narrative is fate almost mm-hmm. that it has to go this way. But there's also its own destruction like built in cause it could go, it could go too far or something it could become too greedy. And so I think he's trying to find some like middle ground, some like moral capitalism basically like and that i think judge templeton is like the archetypal figure of that of like if you're past passionately disengaged <laughs> with the struggling of others just like like this isn't my problem but we should probably get natty out of the stockades it's like a dream well it's also like it's a sort of thing where it's like we need to uphold this sort of like charade of justice Mm-hmm. Um, but the happiness of the story relies on the rich person coming in at the end with a big bag of money to make everything okay. Yeah. And I mean, you, especially from this era of novels, um, so much of that, that's all the plot is. Yeah. Like the end of it resolution is, oh, you have uh, uh, a, a more aristocratic bro- bloodline than you th- initially thought. Or yeah, yeah. here's a rich person who's going to come with a giant, like, a heap of cash to uh to load in on it but um oh um but we also like natty's exiled at the end of this yeah. right he's pardoned uh his fines are paid but he's like i'm gonna go f off to michigan somewhere or the great yeah. lakes the great lakes region he calls it um kind of like hiawatha 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 mm-hmm. um sort of thing or actually that's where hiawatha is from so that was preceding that but um yeah, and then Oliver and Elizabeth marry. Um, oh, we do find out that uh, the reason that Richard Jones thought Natty was uh, you know, mining silver is because Jotham Riddle had discussed or had it told to him by a magic sibyl, like right. basically a fortune teller. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then we also have the. Uh, actually, I, I want to play this grave inscription part in the last bit just because it's it's. It, there's certain touches where it does seem like Fenimore Cooper gets it a little bit, like the way he's like Chingachgook name gets misspelled. And like we should really, you know, not misspell that guy. Yes. Yeah. Um. And and Natty's actually very pleased or and honored to be on Effingham's uh, grave inscription, which is like he it's like the loyal loyalist Natty, I think. A yeah. Bit. Well, well, I'm bold to say it's all right. There's something that I suppose is reading. But I can't make anything of it, though the pipe and the tomahawk and the moccasins be pretty well, pretty well for a man that, I dares to say, never seed either of the things. Ah's me. There they lie, side by side, happy enough. Who will there be to put me in the earth when my time comes? When that unfortunate hour arrives, Natty, friends shall not be wanting to perform the last offices for you, said Oliver, a little touched at the hunter's soliloquy. The old man turned, without manifesting surprise, for he had got the Indian habits in this particular, and running his hand under the bottom of his nose seemed to wipe away his sorrow with the action. "'You've come out to see the graves, children, have you?' he said. "'Well, well, they're wholesome sights to young as well as old.' "'I hope they are fitted to your liking,' said Effingham. "'No one has a better right than yourself to be consulted in the matter.' "'Why, seeing that I ain't used to fine graves,' returned the old man, it is but little matter concerning my taste. You laid the major's head to the west, and Mohegan's to the east, did you, lad? At your request it was done. 
"'It's so best,' said the hunter. "'They thought they had to journey different ways, children, though there is one greater than all who will bring the just together, at his own time, and who will whiten the skin of a blackamoor, and place him on a footing with princes.' bit more uh, explicit r- racial caste yeah. set in there. And also, it's like, it also doesn't matter, this struggle that's going on, because this will all be equalized later in the future by some greater power beyond us. Oh, yeah, us. yeah, yeah. So it's like, don't worry about the struggle, it's just the universe getting to know itself. Cooper was a uh, anti-abolitionist. There is but little reason to doubt that, said Elizabeth, whose decided tones were changed to a soft, melancholy voice. I trust we shall all meet again and be happy together. Yeah, I mean, we don't need to go any further on that. But uh, I, I I didn't quit, get the time code for Chingachgook being misspelled. But I also want to spend... I don't know if maybe I'll do a live stream or maybe we talk about him more in Last of the Mohicans. But because um, I, I don't think we maybe spent enough time on him in either of these parts. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think actually he's the moral center of if you were going to... Uh, sort of update this book f- and I think even you wouldn't need to do much because I think Fenmar Cooper had a lot of this element too but like his struggle and what he must be feeling internally is the most interesting part of this and most telling mm. I think about um, how we're supposed to feel about uh, the new Effingham or n- the new uh, Templeton basically yeah um, well with that said Alex Thank you for joining me for a part two of this guy. Yep. And uh, we will see you next time. Uh, oh, become a patron. Uh, Patreon.com mm. slash literary hangover. I'm going to start doing some live streaming and stuff. Um, yeah, and uh, if patrons will get the first access to that. Uh, until then, I'll see you next time.